Today's scripture is Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where thieves do not break in and steal. For your treasure is there will your heart be also. Making sure that this works properly. <laughs> Are you getting stuff in the back? We're good? All right. Good morning, church family. Hi. Happy Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> it is a happy Sabbath, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I am very thankful for the rest of the Sabbath. I am very thankful after the week that we've had for the opportunity to just pause from the labors. Andrea, of course, is, is on summer vacation. And so uh, whatever summer vacation is for a teacher, how many days in the classroom did you spend or up at school? She lost count. And just because now that we both have a little bit more free time, we decided to do a major landscaping project. And so uh, backs are sore, knees are sore, hands are sore. But uh, we praise the Lord for Sabbath rest. How many of you are thankful for the opportunity to pause from your labors? Amen. Well, I want to take a minute here. I want to ask you a question. What is the worst gift that you have ever received? I want you to think about that for a second. What is the worst gift that you have ever received? Something come to mind to you? I'm going to take a guess here, by the way, and I'm going to guess that the worst gift for you was probably not a four-year-old's drawing of your family that looks like something Picasso did, if you know what I mean. I'm going to take a guess here and, and, and just throw it out there. I'm guessing it's not where you received, oh, there we go. Now, why is that showing up? One second. There we go. I'm going to take a guess and, and just venture that it's not when you had somebody give you half-dead flowers because, because you knew that they could only afford half-dead flowers and they took food off of their table in order to give them to you. I'm guessing that those aren't the worst gifts you've ever received. When I say the worst gift you've ever received, you probably think of something where somebody had the capability of giving something and they didn't put their best effort out. They didn't give something that was appropriate to the situation. They didn't really try hard. Let me explain what I'm talking about here. My sermon title today, Treadmills and Fat Cows. I want to preface this by saying that my sermon title is two completely separate entities. The treadmills and the fat cows are two completely separate things. Treadmills. When I was six years old, I learned a lesson in gift giving from my dad. My father has never been the most romantic guy ever. And uh, he, he tries bless his heart, he tries to give good gifts. My mom is a little health conscious, a little body image conscious. Uh, she probably is a couple pounds heavier than she would like to be and has mentioned this from time to time. Don't we all think we could lose a couple pounds, or most of us? So after expressing this several times over and over again, my dad decided that he was going to buy my mom a treadmill. 
Ladies, do you see any problem with this? Gentlemen, do you see any problem in this? Now let me go ahead and by the way mention, he bought this for her for Valentine's Day. <laughs> I later found out that my, uh, my dad said it was rather comfortable to sleep on because he was there for the next week. <laughs> There's something to be said about having the ability to give good gifts but somehow missing the mark. The issue with the treadmill, and I'm sure you'd agree with this, the issue wasn't the treadmill itself because it was a nice treadmill. The issue was that the gift didn't speak to the desires of the heart of its recipient. Way too often we get this idea that I'm going to give, for example, I'm doing my best as a husband. I do my best to, to give good gifts to Andrea. But way too often the gift that I give to Andrea ha has been, and I'm learning, less what she wants and more what I would like to give her. So usually it has a power cord of some kind. <laughs> or, or peanut butter filling. <laughs> you know what I mean when I say the issue is that the gift doesn't speak to the desires of the heart of its recipient. You know what I'm talking about? When I start to talk about, when I ask you, what is the worst gift you've ever received? Now it's probably clicking for you somewhere in there, right? Where your significant other or your child, just you, you look at it and you say, that's nice. But they just didn't have it all together for some reason. I'm not saying it's a bad gift, but I'm saying that maybe there's something to be learned in the gifts that we give and the person we give them to. Yes, I know what you're immediately thinking, and yes, it is. This is the money sermon. Rut Row's right. Please pray for me. I want to tell you that as I preach today on stewardship, it is not my goal to get up here and beat you over the head that you need to give more. I want to praise the Lord as I look at some of our statistics and, and as I hear our monthly reports. This church still seems to have a real good setup when it comes to finances. We're doing well, but could we do better? Absolutely. When I talk about stewardship, I'm reminded of a verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. So let each one of us give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. I'm not up here to say, you have to do it because I'm forcing you to get over it. But when we talk about stewardship, it's all got to start with the idea of giving from a cheerful heart. God loves a cheerful heart. When we're talking about stewardship, another lesson to remember is Deuteronomy chapter 14, I believe. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 10. For the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. You're not going to bribe God into, into letting you into heaven. And he'll see through when you give it on phony pretenses. But what I'm going to talk to you today, when we talk about stewardship, stewardship isn't about paying membership dues. It's about speaking one of God's love languages. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, as we talk about stewardship today, sharing with you from the abundance with which you have shared with us, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. Help us to understand how to be faithful stewards with what you have given us. Lord, I pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said, part of the reason that I'm sharing with you stewardship isn't to necessarily come at the Paw Paw Church or any, any person in particular. But we all have something to learn about stewardship. Stewardship across the board is something that is, is uh, you know, could always use some better education. I found a statistic a couple of days ago. 
Only 60%, 60% of Adventist church members in the North American division give tithes or offerings. That's only three out of five people contribute anything to the church on any sort of level. In the Michigan Conference, we know that we've been hit real hard with our finances, with the economy being what it is. So tithe is just a little bit down. And the work is being affected. So you'll hear more about stewardship uh, if you pay attention to things like the Michigan Memo. If you go to camp meeting, we'll talk about stewardship, and, and this is where it's coming from. But what I want to do today is I want to give you just the real 101 basics. Just make sure we all have the same understanding of stewardship. Sound good? All right. And I promise I'll try to make it fun too. I'm not going to beat you over the head with this. First question is, when you put the money in the plate and you marked it for tithe, what is done with my tithe money? Just a good question. Just out of curiosity, when I say tithe, how many of you think... Phrase it another way. If you think that tithe money stays here in the Paw Paw Church, any percentage of it, I'd like you to raise your hand. Just kind of curious, getting a survey. I see some hands going up, and that's okay to be honest. You'll find out as we go forward what is done with tithe money. This is where the second part of the sermon title comes in. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 41. We're going to talk about fat cows now. No, there is no mental image of a fat cow on a treadmill. We're going to turn to Genesis chapter 41. We're going to turn to the experience of Joseph. And when I say fat cows and Joseph, now do you know where I'm, I'm starting to head? Many of you are pro probably familiar with this idea. Joseph is in prison. Joseph's been in prison for some time now for a crime that he didn't commit, but they don't seem to care. He's in prison. This is Genesis chapter 41. At the end of two full years, verse 1, Pharaoh had a dream. Joseph has been rotting in prison for two years after he helped out a guy who had the ability to help him out. And then the Pharaoh has a dream, and all of a sudden, oh yeah, let's go talk to that Joseph guy. We know exactly where he is. Here's the dream. Suddenly, there came up out of the river seven cows looking fine and fat. They fed in the meadow. Behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly, gaunt. They stood by the other cows on the bank of the river, and the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking cows. Pharaoh woke up. Well, that's a dream for you. You see seven fat cows devoured by seven ugly, malnourished cows. You get the mental image? He managed to go back to sleep, and he dreamt a second time. Suddenly seven heads of grain came up one stalk, plump and good. And then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. And Pharaoh woke, and indeed, it was a dream. They called Joseph. Joseph is the one who seems to have the ability to interpret dreams. We did a whole series on Daniel, who's one of the more famous dream interpreters. But the first dream interpreter that we really run across is Joseph. How does he interpret these dreams? Does anybody know? Seven good years, seven bad years. We have a famine coming. There's an emergency. It's going to last seven years. You've got seven years of warning that at the end of the seventh year, we have seven years of emergency coming up. What would you do if you were told that seven years from today, you would lose your job, you would lose your insurance, you would lose all of your sources of income? What would you do if you had seven years warning? You would do everything you could to prepare. The same was hap with what happened in this story. How did they prepare? Joseph, Genesis chapter 41, verses 34 and 35. Let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint officers over the land, collect a fifth of the produce 
of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. Let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming. Store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh. Let them keep food in the cities. Then that food will be a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt. So what they had to do was, for seven years, prepare. They didn't have checking accounts like we have. They didn't have uh, freeze-dried and, and deep freezers like we have today. The best that they could do was they built these giant storehouses, much like silos. They built these giant storehouses. They've got seven years to get ready. And then they would distribute. They would ration it out. It is this storehouse model that is the basis of how the Seventh-day Adventist Church handles its tithe money, for those of you who are wondering. So to answer your question, the answer to the question earlier, what percentage of any stays in a local church? The answer I put on the screen. Here's a pie chart that shows where all of your tithe money goes. The brown is what goes to the conference storehouse. That's 100%. The other section is what stays here. Do you see that? That's nothing. None of our tithe actually stays here in Pawpaw. And this might seem weird to you. And we'll talk about why we do this in just a minute. But first and foremost, then we have to ask ourselves, well, what is tithe money even used for? If they're going to take all of the money and put it in a storehouse, what do they spend it on? Is it just so that we can have a big, beautiful conference office in Lansing with the gold doorknobs and stuff like that? If you've been to the conference office in Lansing, you probably know that they aren't using it to build this big cathedral of, of Adventism. Uh, the, the stairs are kind of wobbly in places, and, and the offices could probably use new carpet or, or things like that. Instead, what we do is we use tithe money according to what we find in Deuteronomy chapter 14. Biblically speaking, tithe money has always seemed to be stored up for the Levites. These are the workers in the Lord's service. The Levites were the ones who would do the Lord's ministry. They were the only ones who weren't given a place of land of their own. Instead, everybody else would give a little bit of what they had come in. It would go to the Levites so that they could do the Lord's work. So the Bible's teaching on tithe is to give the money to the Levites. Who are today's Levites? Pastors are one. Teachers are another. Conference officers and administrators are another. There are several categories of people who have dedicated their lives to full-time service for God. And it takes various forms, and tithe money is used to help in those things. In some instances, for example, in, in the case of, of uh, teachers, a lot of tithe money goes not to cover their salary so much as it does to cover the benefits, the retirement, to help out with insurance and things like that. Uh, schools and tuition cover some of their salaries. But if we wanted to pay everything that a teacher is worth, <laughs> Andrea chuckles. If you're a teacher, you know that we couldn't possibly afford to cover everything that a teacher's worth. But some of tithe money is used for that. The Bible's teaching on tithe recommends a 10% of your income to help those in ministry. Tithe means 10% or one-tenth. And so when we talk about what is done with that 10% that you give, 10, or all of the tithe money ends up back in Lansing. Some of it goes further to help the union officers, the full-time workers there, some in the division, and some in the general conference. But the majority of it will stay in, in this conference storehouse to help out the work in Michigan, for example. You're in Michigan, that's relative to the sermon. Why is this model important? One of the things that I'm thoroughly blessed by is that every pastor, no matter what their congregation is, no matter what their church's giving capability is, every pastor actually receives the same level wages. So Pastor Dwight Nelson, who's about an hour southwest of here, with a 3,500-member church and million in tithe a year, makes the same amount of money as the Pastor Nelson 
that's just to the east of us over in Centerville with about 300 members. There is a 10 times difference between their two congregations, but they receive identical pay. Why is this important? Because then you don't call money a reason to deny or accept a calling. You go where God is going. If God wants me to get up and go to the Upper Peninsula, I wouldn't have to worry about moving from a larger church like Pawpaw into a smaller church like something in like Munising, for example. Wouldn't have to worry about it because we share and we share alike. Other, con or other denominations don't have this model. I think of, of uh, some of our non-denominational friends. Uh, anybody know who this guy is, for example? That is Joel Osteen, if you don't know who he is. His current net worth is debated. It's somewhere between 40 and $56 million, his net worth. What goes to his church stays in his church. On the other side, you have bivocational pastors. Pastors who can only work part-time for the ministry and have to spend the rest of the time working another field. 30% of Baptist pastors have to be bivocational. And so you will have some pastors who are driving Bentleys and some pastors who are driving pizza delivery cars. Now do you start to see why it might be a benefit to have the storehouse model? Because we can go where the Lord's work needs to be done. And nobody has to worry about losing out on, on wealth at least. And so when we're talking about doing the Lord's work, you might wonder, is it possible to give too much of a good thing, ruin the whole experience? I wonder that. You know why I wonder that? Because of something that happened with Andrea and I it's about 11 years ago. No, it was just about 10 years ago this summer. Andrea loves flowers. Well, lady doesn't love a little flower occasionally. If she doesn't, gentlemen, make sure you give wise gifts. <laughs> I knew that Andrea loved flowers, though. And I overdid it. <sighs> Do you know what that is? That is 31 dozen carnations. That is what it looks like when I decide that I'm going to buy one carnation for every day that we had been dating. Everybody say it with me now. Aww. <laughs> but actually, let me, let me take it back a second. If you look very closely, you see those little slips of paper? It says, thank you for August 1st, 2003. Thank you for August 2nd, 2003. Thank you for August 3rd, 2003. Thank you for September 26th, 2003. Thank you for February 2nd, 2004. I had one staple to every note. I took the flowers. I snuck over to her mom's house. She was living with her mom. I snuck over to her mom's house. It was our anniversary and we made a deal. I couldn't wake her up before seven o'clock. I got there at quarter after five in the morning. And I started to lay them out. It took six of those styrofoam party ice chests, you know what I mean, like the party coolers? It took six of them, the whole back of my mom's SUV to get them over to her house. August 1st at the door, August 2nd next to it, August 3rd, August 4th, August 5th, down the porch, up the sidewalk, to the driveway, up the driveway, into the backyard, up the porch, around the porch, around the swimming pool, and into the tent that I had coincidentally set up that weekend to test out and see if it handles water well, even though it wasn't supposed to rain. Uh, and into there, I, I had the rest of her gift for. Seven o'clock on the dot, I pull up my cell phone, I call her, say, honey, honey, go to your front door. I'm on the back side of her house. I'm 50 yards away from her. And I hear her start yelling, what did you do? <laughs> I come to find out that after, oh, sometime in, what was it? January, maybe February, she's already tired of picking them up. And so I look over and she's kicking them with her feet because she's so tired of picking them up, kicking them to the next cooler. <laughs> is it possible to give a gift that is too much of the good thing and then ruin the experience? <laughs> Do you think I gave her flowers again after that? It took a while before either of us wanted to see another flower again. 
And so some of you might be wondering, you know what? If, I'll tell you what, Pastor. I'll just drop a—I made a hundred bucks this week. I'll drop a 20 in the offering plate. We'll call it tithe. Will that end your stewardship sermon? My answer would be no. My answer would be no because God has asked for 10%. When you follow it through, tithe is 10%. It's interesting. Uh, a couple of different places in the Bible, God asks the census of the people, and one of the things they do is they have to give a, a half a shekel for the census fee. And he specifically says, if you can't give more, I'm sorry, if, if it's going to be a little bit of a stretch for you, then maybe you'll have to sacrifice a little bit. But if you can, still only give half. All I've asked for is half. I can do an amazing thing with just half a shekel. God says, I can do an amazing thing if I just get 10%. I can do all the work that needs to be done with all of the workers. I can cover the world field with 10%. Recent surveys suggested, according to one of the divisions that did the research, that our division gives approximately $1.9 billion in tithe each year. But if we actually went through and we looked at how many members we had and the actual giving capability of these members, we should actually have brought in somewhere around $14 billion in the same time period. That is one-seventh of the amount of money that we have possible have coming in. And so you might ask the question, well, I can give more. What if I want to give more? Uh, it's something that, you know, you might, like this boy, wonder, how come the waitress gets 15% and God only gets 10%? <laughs> so the system for giving beyond tithe, we call them offerings. This is a biblical concept as well. Tithe is a biblical concept. Offerings are a biblical concept. You got your Bibles open. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 36. Exodus chapter 36 describes the system of offerings in this way. They want to build the first sanctuary. They want to build the portable tabernacle in the wilderness. Do they collect tithe money to pay for it? No. Tithe money was for the priests, or the, the tithes were for the priests. Je Exodus chapter 36, starting in verse 2. Let's jump to verse 3. They received from Moses all of the offering which the children of, God, of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary. They continued to bring him free will offerings every morning. What we see here is the introduction of this model. Free will offerings. It's important to realize that even the very first sanctuary, the local congregation, was built using offerings, not tithe. And what happens in this story is really amazing. All the craftsmen who were doing all of the work of the sanctuary came, each from their own work as they were doing. They spoke to Moses and they said, you know what? People bring us much more than is enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. How awesome would this be if we were able to get Chris, our finance chair, to get up here one week for our offering appeal and say, you know what? We're good. <laughs> Nothing loose. Tithe is fine. Got to pay for the workers. But Pawpaw's done. We don't need anything. That would be a memorable appeal, wouldn't it? Because this is what Moses actually does. Moses gave the commandment. They caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp saying, let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing for the material that they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. And in fact, too much. The people gave so much they were told to stop bringing offerings. It's amazing, isn't it? And so when we think about how much would be too much, it's possible to give too much of a good thing, right? So what is a good balance? Looking for something practical here. So here's the recommendation. If you get it from the church, you, you, you may have heard this before. You'll see it in your bulletin or in your tithe off envelopes. For every hundred bucks you make, let's make it simple. 10%. 10% of a hundred bucks is how much money? $10. The next section is somewhere between three and five percent. So for every hundred, three to five bucks. Is that a lot of money? For some people, yes. But for, uh, percentage wise, three to five dollars is 
Maybe one less trip to Starbucks. One dollar goes to map. So I'm going to test and see. I'm going to call up, oh, who's good in math? I'd like to call Isaac up because you were immediately pointed out. I want to see how we're doing so far in understanding what I'm talking about. Isaac, got a dollar here. Scattered change. How much goes to God? One dollar. How much? One, I'm going to give this all to you. How much would be tithe? Ten cents. Ten cents. Okay, so that's tithe. How much would go to the local church's work? Uh, three, to five, three to five cents. Three to five cents. Let's cut it in the middle. We'll call it four, right? Okay. How much goes to MAP or, or other local work? One cent. One cent. What's left? Uh, 85 cents. 85 cents. We got one of our best ones up here. <laughs> when you compare and contrast, 85 cents, 15 cents, right? Which one's bigger? 85. 85 cents. Now let me ask you an interesting question. How much of this is God's money? All of it. All of it. That's a good answer. So you got to be faithful with your 85 too, but the vast majority of it that he's left for you to do the rest of yourself, that, that's a fair amount of money, right? Yeah. I, I mean, out of this, very good. So appreciate it. I'll, I'll get you your cash later. I'm going to use this another time. <laughs> good job. So... The, that's the recommended giving plan. And so you're probably wondering, because this is one of the major roadblocks the statistics show, one of the major roadblocks is, am I getting the most for my money? Am I getting the best bang for my buck if I'm giving money to a given organization? And so you probably wonder, how does Pawpaw spend the money that it gets? When the, when the church offering that Suvan made an appeal for, when the church makes an offering uh, and you drop the cash in the plate, how do we use it? Well, let me let you know. Roughly, was it 28% of our church uh, money goes to facility-related issues? Things like insurance, repairs, utilities. And I grabbed this off of the most recent uh, finance report. So for every dollar that Pawpaw gets, roughly a quarter of it will go to helping out the building itself with utilities, repairs, and insurance. The rest of it goes for mission or projects. The rest of it will go to everything from the copy machine to make those bulletins. Education support to help out with our finance plan. By the way, if you didn't realize this, roughly half of this category goes into our education expenses. Over $40,000 a year out of our roughly $120,000 a year budget goes to helping out expenses. It takes a commitment from our church family in order to help our education plan stay what it is. This is a team effort. Other than that, though, you see things like evangelism, family life, health ministries, multimedia. Multimedia guys, how do you like the new soundboard back there? Love it. <laughs> Pathfinders and adventurers, Sabbath school, those quarterlies, our secretary, Pauletta, we, this is some of the expenses. Social activities, our youth class. These are just some of the things that we use our money to go towards. Now let me clarify one thing for you that you might want to pay attention to. Suppose that you have a special burden in your heart for one of those categories. For example, like social activities. And you decide, you know what? I love social activities. Pathfinders, not so much. For whatever reason, I'm just throwing it out there hypothetically. You decide that you want to get straight to social activities. You're going to bypass church budget and you're going to put all of your offerings into social. Is there a problem that will come up with that eventually? Chris, what would happen if everybody just decided to only give to the one special project that they deemed was necessary? It, things would quickly dry up. There is a reason that we are trying our best as a church to fight the balance on our finances, to make sure that our departments uh, support each other equally, can contribute and help each other equally as a church to grow. And, and so we would encourage you as best as possible, if you're going to give and you don't know where to give, give to the combined budget because that will help the broadest spectrum of the church family. Sure, you might have a special passion like helping the Pathfinders get to Oshkosh. 
But that would perhaps, my recommendation would be, maybe even above and beyond. And I know you're probably thinking, oh, pastor, all this talk of money. Don't you know? Don't you know what I'm going through right now? Don't you know how the economy's been? I completely understand. I completely understand. You probably ask the question, what if I can't give more? If asked before, what if I want to give more? You probably want to know, what if I can't give more? I've got a story for you. Open your Bibles. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. One of the things I love about the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to test, test Giovanni here and see how well he can remember it. The Gospel of Luke, was it written for good, good church people? See how well you remember our Bible studies that we spent a year doing down at the village school. Was the Gospel of Luke written for the good church people? No. Who was the Gospel of Luke written for? The outcasts, the outsiders. These are the people who aren't the best and the brightest, the wealthiest and the, and the most prestigious people. So the Gospel of Luke will include stories of people who don't have or don't fit in. I love this story he includes here. Jesus. Luke chapter 21, starting in verse 1. He looked up. He saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. Rather than passing a plate so you could discreetly put in your offering, you got a place for the treasury. And these people would come up here, their money bags are clinking, the coins, sometimes even get the smaller amounts so that you get a little bit more clink. You know the, you know the Michigan roll, bank roll, where you, you, you put the big bills on the outside, like a 10 or a 20, and then just get a pile of ones. <laughs> As a server, I've carried the Michigan bankroll. So you carry it up there. You drop your money in. A little bit at a time. You make sure that everybody hears what's happening. Are they giving a lot of money? Perhaps. But then he saw a certain poor widow putting in two mites. One, two. I, I'm guessing she didn't do it like that either, do you think? After the show that everybody else put on, do you think that's how she put her money in? You may have not even heard the change hit the bottom of the box. How does Jesus respond? Truly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. Do you know how much two mites is, by the way? When he's talking about putting in more than all, the average day laborer could earn two mites for six minutes worth of labor. My sermon right now is at uh, 36 minutes. That means that I have earned six times more money for preaching than this widow would have. That's all she had, though. She puts it in. For all of these put out of their abundance. They put in their offerings for God. But she out of the poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. What is she doing here? Why is Jesus commending her? Why does he say that this is more than all? Is it because the gift came from the heart? It was the best that she had to offer. Much like that four-year-old's Picasso family portrait. Much like those half-wilted piles of flowers. It was the best she had to offer straight from her heart. Jesus loved that. And what's interesting, by the way, is, is she giving into a corrupt system? At this point, had the Sadducees completely corrupted the system? And does Jesus still applaud her for giving from her heart. To recap for a second, make sure we're all on board. What's done with my tithe money? Tithe goes to what? Goes to a storehouse. What if I want to give more? We have offerings 
to help out the local work, the state programs, etc. What if I can't give more? God loves gifts from our heart, and every little bit counts. Every little bit helps in doing God's work. This is, after all, the same Jesus who could take fish and loaves, enough to feed just a little boy, and turn it into enough to feed an entire countryside full of men. You think he can multiply and do amazing things with whatever little is set before him from an open heart? Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 16. Do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. I said it before, I'll say it again. When I talk about stewardship, it's not about paying membership dues. It, I preach this sermon, I'm not going to get an extra dollar in my paycheck because I preach this sermon. At the end of the day, it's about speaking one of God's love languages. Did you hear those verses? God loves a cheerful giver. God is well pleased when we share. This is something that makes God excited. Do you want to make God excited in the things that you do? But for some of you, I recognize that once again, as I talk about stewardship, as I talk about cash, for some of you, you're thinking, how in the world am I possibly going to make this work? Andrew and I have two student loan payments. We went to Andrew's. <laughs> We've got two cars. We've got a house. We know what the, we, we know what the pinch is. We always wonder, how in the world are you going to make it work out, God? We laugh about this looking back. When we went to Andrews, way back when, the first time, when we went back to Andrews, we can't believe this. Neither of us had a job lined up when we got there. We didn't even have much of a nest egg built up. We had spent a few months saving up my, wait, my tips from waiting tables at a buffet. And we spent a few months saving up the money that she had as an entry-level person at, a, at an insurance company. We went down with not a whole lot else besides that which could fit into family and graduate housing. Andrea knows, we'll tell you about family and graduate housing, that, that first apartment that we had, and it was all that we could afford. And we don't even know how we could afford this place. Where you sit down to put on your clothes, the dresser is so close to the bed, you've got to like split your legs or move your legs around so that you can open the, the dresser drawers. We've been there. Waiting tables at Applebee's for two and a half years in order to pay for rent, in order to pay for food, in order to pay for books. We went down there just on total faith. We didn't have an extravagant lifestyle. We ended up living in some lady's basement. But God always seemed to find a way to make it work out. We just put it in his hands. And it, it, we have miraculous stories. We laugh, for example. I was the only non-smoking server on staff at Applebee's. So guess what section they would put me in every single night I worked before they've had the state smoking ban? Smoking section. They put me in there for two reasons. One, because smoking is the section that nobody wants. It's hard to dictate when a smoker comes in. And so frequently the smoking section was the empty section. The other reason is because they had the longest, hardest work on the inside of the, of the kitchen. Like you had to do the most cleaning work. I kid you not, I would text Andrea. I'd call Andrea. I'd tell her, I'm in smoking again tonight. Well, God knows what he's doing. He knows that we've got rent due. He knows what he's doing. I would go into my section, two other servers with me. The three servers, we'd, we would go through the dinner rush and have a combined four tables show up. Right after the dinner rush, they'd send the other two servers home. 
Mike, you might as well go ahead and start getting stuff pre-done for your, uh, for your end of the night duties. But I never had time to do it then. Because without fail, as soon as they cut the other servers, the next 11 tables in a row wanted to sit in the smoking section. Many of them weren't even smokers. And I went from the empty section to the full section. And my coworkers would look at me as I went from kind of standing around and filling up salsa and ranch containers to running around like a maniac with four drink orders, two appetizers, and, and somewhere on here is dessert. You, you know, like when you go to a Mexican restaurant and, and they got the food, that was me at Applebee's. My coworkers would look at me at the end of the night, how did you do that? Don't ask me, ask him. Never had a late bill. The only time that we bounced anything in our checking account was when I forgot to stick my ones in the ATM. My own dumb fault. We bounced a, a, a we had an overdraft fee one time. It wasn't God's fault. He took care of us. It's my fault. How often is it our fault that we get into the problems with stewardship that we have? Making the money go as far as we need to. What I want to encourage you to do, and this is something that we all can do, is to just have faith in God to know that He is going to provide. He is going to take care of you. It's all going to work out. I want to encourage you, when we talk about stewardship, to trust in Jesus and to be faithful in Him. Because let me tell you, it is sweet to trust in Jesus. You like that transition to the closing hymn? Our closing hymn today is, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus," because it's so true. How many of you have, in your own experience, when you look back, maybe in your early years, maybe earlier this week, how many of you have an experience of you said, you know what, I'm just gonna step out, I'm gonna trust God with my finances, and boy, did he bless. How many of you have, have a similar experience? I see some hands going up, praise the Lord. How many of you wanna have an experience where God promises in Malachi chapter three, just try me on this. Try me on tithes and offerings, be faithful to me, and see if I don't open things up. The windows of heaven, of my heavenly storehouses, and pour out with such abundance. How many of you want to trust in Jesus? Amen. Amen. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Our closing song, I want you to stand. I've got our song leaders coming forward here. Mm -hmm.